The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Fridays with Vico webinar, part of our new Hard Bid series. We want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time out of your schedule to learn more about hard bids and better understand how BIM technologies, specifically VICO technologies and methodologies, are impacting the current AEC market. Because we have such a large group assembled today, uh, we simply ask that you please mute your phone lines or mute your VoIP microphone. This will cut down on background noise for the group. My name is Holly Allison. I'll be serving as moderator for today's event, and I'm in Vico's Boston office. Joining us from Miami, Florida, is Clive Jordan. Clive is one of Vico's 5D BIM consultants. You know, Clive has worn just about every hat here at Vico, from leading our business development efforts in the UK and the Middle East, to helping many of our customers as their on-site project manager in our services division. And Clive is also one of our experts in Vico Control, our scheduling solution, which will be in the spotlight today. You know, at Vico, we are keenly aware that the economy fell apart last September. And while backlogs will support us for 2010, part of 2011, we know the bidding environment has changed dramatically. Now it's predominantly hard bids everywhere. And to top it off, at least 20 companies are bidding on the same job. Our services di team, and many of you might not know, we also have a services division. So we sell both software and we are uh, BIM consultants. But our services team has developed some new service offerings to help our customers better compete in this hard bid environment. And we've developed this four-part webinar series to share many of these strategies. Today we'll start with the schedule. In another installment, we'll move to the estimate. Then we'll look at constructability and coordination. And then we'll conclude the series with a discussion of whether or not to build or buy a knowledge base for cost and time elements. We have three goals for today's webinar. The first is to examine the current hard bid environment and see how a tighter schedule actually helps you mitigate risk. Then we'll explain how location-based quantities are the key to an accurate BIM-based schedule. And then we'll also show how that 4D schedule can produce not only a business development movie, but, a sci but scientifically derive a schedule with a full 10 to 20 percent uh, shorter than average schedule duration. Then we'll see how that schedule can be used for production control in the field to make certain that you meet that schedule, that schedule target. Now, with every Fridays with FICO webinar, we take questions at the end. But you can write a question at any time if you have a particular question about a slide or something Clive says uh, doesn't sit right with you. Feel free to type in a question at any time. Just locate the questions pane in your GoToWebinar control panel. Type your question in and send it in. We'll answer them at the end of the presentation in the order in which they're received. Well, let's get started with today's presentation. I'm just going to hand control over to Clive and let him kick this off. Again, our thanks to everyone for joining us today. Clive, whenever you're ready, just go ahead and accept control and go ahead and show us your screen and we'll get started. Fantastic. Thank you, Holly. Let me know when you can see it. It should be coming to a screen near you. I see the puppy. <laughs> Fantastic. OK, thanks for the introduction, Holly. Um, we'll go through a uh, rough agenda. Um, obviously, we're going to review how contracts have been changing recently, how we've been entering uh, this new phase, new bidding phase for work, how uh, BIM can help us, and we'll really focus on answering the question of what actually 4D is. Um, we'll see the differences of quantities by location, how this can support our hard bid contracting, and really how we can use this to optimize the 4D BIM. Uh, compressed schedules, and uh, also to understand what-if scenarios so we can implement uh, different trials and options for our clients that are more demanding um, in this hard bid environment. Um, we'll move on to understanding how a standard database can also help us. 
and um, after a summary, we'll open it to, to questions and answers. And hopefully, at some point, our friend uh, Jean Baptiste Vico will butt in, uh, provide us a, an anecdote for uh, guidance on our true 4D path. Let's see. So, we've seen progressive types negotiated bid contracts uh, becoming more popular and have been helping the industry to uh, collaborate a bit better, provide hopefully the owners more desirable end results. Um, but presently, owners are finding themselves in a in a buyer's market where hard bid contracts appear to be a more sensible choice. Uh, there's huge competition to win the bids and uh, also such few con contracts and number of contracts available. Many have more than 20 bidders um, buying for, for this small number of jobs and we see the traditional um, margins in the industry of around 3%. They seem even smaller when everyone's trying to cut the costs and um, and win the, broad, the projects with a, a low as possible overhead. Um, so realistically at the moment when it is at an all-time high, we can see that the devil's in the detail and we need to track more. We need to document more and we need to track more than, rather than less. Um, as we usually look at contracts and end up in a firefighting process um, and try and manage the project and um, put, as the contractor does, their change orders in. Um, they'll be incredibly more difficult in this environment to be able to actually get approved. And I believe that it's whoever manages the projects better now in the details will come out on top at the end of it. A few quotes to see where the money is um, going to be spent, this recovery fund. A fixed price contract should be employed to the maximum extent possible. And uh, we're being told that the government should be exposed to the least risk possible. Um, whether we agree um, as, a, as a whole on the current administration, uh, whether we agree that um, this is really going to be the right way to uh, distribute funds, it is actually a reality that we're seeing uh, in the hard bid contracting environment. Um, Obama notes the risk to taxpayers' money um, we're relying on this cost type, cost plus type uh, contract can be wasteful, inefficient, and also subject to misuse. So they're looking to strengthen uh, contract oversight and maximise the competition in procurement. So it's being seen um, as as being an important note at the moment. So as we have fewer projects and more competition, um, all trying to win with reduced margins. Um, and less margin, there's less margin for error, um, obviously. Um, it's imperative to main, remain uh, competitive, make, making our general fees and conditions uh, at the lowest possible um, pinch point. And uh, usually when we're in a hard bid environment, this management of the fee and general conditions can be a difficult balancing act. Um, and not always can we make up the difference with change orders. Um, extension of time. Not, doesn't usually include um, the general conditions, so it could be a large chunk of the funds um, that we don't actually recover. So in general, this webinar is about doing more with less and how to benefit from 4D technology to truly optimize a more predictable schedule, something that's more controllable, um, and we'll show how true 4D BIM does actually support the site work, how to um, actually bid a shorter schedule and actually manage that schedule um, to its completion based on the targets that we set. So first, let's ask the question, uh, what actually is 4D? Um, does the connection of 3D plus time actually result in 4D? Is that how we um, understand 4D in the industry? Um, it is in, in many eyes, um, and a lot of owners believe uh, that this 4D uh, this great movie um, provides us uh, enormous benefit. But most of the 4D representations uh, that we depict are really a great movie for marketing and uh, sequencing benefits. But um, actually, the, the, the granular level of detail is missing. Um, sometimes, it, it, imagine somebody in a corner sniggering as they review a 4D playback. Um, so, uh, Dave, come and have a look at this. Uh, according to this, we're building the columns on the fourth floor before we've even created the fourth floor. Uh, tell the intern that we, we may need some skyhooks. Um, 
and the pun goes on and on. So there are some obvious sequencing benefits that come from uh, analyzing things by connecting just the simple 3D to time and the resultant 4D. However, um, the principles of connecting BIM to a schedule, uh, we as a services team um, in Vico have been doing that for many years and we've built supporting best practices and through understanding more about the information that we can generate from the BIM, we believe that there's a better way of doing it. So there's more to 4D than just adding a time component to the 3D object. So it can be used for presenting marketing material and we do get the sequencing benefits, but um, if we add granular detail to that, we can ensure that we get better benefits uh, coming out at the end. I mentioned our friend Vito, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln, he, he once said, it was repeated actually by Warren Buffett, um, asked the question, how many legs does a dog have if you call its tail a leg, a leg as well? Um, and you count four plus the tail, most people would answer five, but the true answer is still four. Just because you call its tail a, a leg, it doesn't actually mean that it is. So the same principle I'm suggesting applies here is that just because we call something 4D doesn't actually mean that it is. So the simple glueware method of producing 4D um, really re results in this pretty movie uh, based on thousands of um, undocumented assumptions. and doesn't really help us build the project. So let's have a look at what does actually constitute 4D, um, true 4D as we are coining in this presentation. When the, the building information model is linked to the schedule through a database of cost and time, you can actually use it to automate the creation of parts of the schedule for you, uh, saving you time and produce, producing a much more accurate and flexible result. So in Instead of spending all of your time doing the data crunching, um, let the, the eye in BIM, the information, do the hard work for you. So we can drive quantities to generate tasks within the locations in which the quantities exist. And the combination of this amount of work and the desired duration will actually dictate the level of resource required to complete the task. Um, so owners should actually be requiring that all the task durations are actually justified with quantities and productivity rates. And it's not a simple means of linking the 3D to the time component. Um, we're actually leveraging the integration of the building information model as we progress. So these are two of the differentiating, differentiating factors as we, we leverage the iron BIM for, for more optimum results. Generally, in a presentation, I don't like to, to show 4D simulations because it's only part of the, the deliverable. It's, it's a, a small uh, part of the benefit from connecting them to the schedule. Um, wasn't actually going to include any in this presentation, uh, but I thought you know, it's kind of sexy as a byproduct. Um, so here are a few examples. But as we can see, um, it's very difficult to just by looking at these movies uh, see whether they're based on real quantities um, and locations and real resource productivities from the building information model and the database. So let those play in the background. But um, we've all seen these 4D representations, but do they actually represent the optimum schedule, the most optimum um, end result on the duration of the project? Well, the true 4D, as we've seen, when we connect the BIM, uh, we require this information transfer. So going from the components, the elements in the building information model, the quantities and the locations, along with an understanding of the resources required per, um, for, the, for the methods that we're using to create the building elements, is driven into a location-based schedule. And this transfer of quantities uh, results in a more granular level of detail um, in order for us to start to optimize the project um, in a planning sense and then control it on site. So let's see how this additional data going from the Gantt chart on the right hand side to down to the flow line underneath, how this additional data has altered our understanding of the plan. In this slide we can see a review of the Gantt chart. So the example at the top as we saw before 
it shows how we are forced to make a, a time-based uh, assumption for the connection between the tasks. We need to understand that um, between task A and task B, or uh, the green task and red task, at some point we need to define when the red task is going to commence. And that's done by a, a guesstimate. Um, we effectively make an assumption of how much of the area we can complete in a certain period of time and then uh, put a lag on a task. Big guesstimates usually end us in hot water when we actually get through to the site um, and it unfolds. Um, and the firefighting that generally evolves on site is somewhat to do with this um, traditional way of, pace, uh, of sending a task to be as soon as possible on a Gantt chart. And maybe we shouldn't actually start it at that point in time. So the flow line, the figure below the Gantt chart, we can see, uh, well, ho hopefully you'll have watched uh, BIM 101, the webinar. Um, if not, you can watch it in the archives after this. But um, we can see how the, the, the lines are represented first as um, just a straight line through which the locations they work. And this is a direct representation of the Gantt chart. And in this example, we're showing that the assumption of uh, progress throughout the Gantt chart bars will actually be linear. However, we are all aware that construction is very varied, and this is rarely the, the, the case on site. So we know that each task will take a different amount of time depending on the amount of work that's there and the level of resource that we plan to use. So the truth is that the factors um, vary from location to location, so we'll end up with um, actually a varying um, pitch of this. The slope of the line will differ depending on the amount of work and the amount of resources that we're adding to these tasks. So when we add quantities by their location in this flow line, we can identify that progress is not actually linear and it doesn't take the same amount of time in each location. So task one, the green task, starts at a lower slope, but um, perhaps you know, that's due to there being less work in that location and it increases towards the end. So we, we start here with a lower slope and we increase towards the end. So it's not actually that we're flowing through locations in a linear fashion. The red line is shown as being starting as a steeper slope. Perhaps uh, we can utilize more resource in these first two locations, so in locations A and B. Perhaps we can utilize more resource. It's a larger area. Maybe they're more productive. Maybe this is tiling, and uh, they can go at a, lower, a larger area rather than being very intricate in uh, location C, which is the small areas in the, um, in the, um, around the vanities. This results, as we can see, in a clash. Um, not it's similar to the 3D class detection that we run through our building information models. So this is actually showing us where trades might clash on site. So these red dots indicate where we could have problems with these trades clashing on the gantcha, on the um, site. Um, and this is only seen by us including this more location-based and granular level of quantity-driven data um, and basing it on real resources and real productivity rates that is, as I hasten to add, extracted automatically from the building information model. So once we've started and we're deriving this information, we have our knowledge base to collect the information, um, getting to this point in time is, is actually quite a simple, um, it's, I just see that we're experiencing audio connection problems. Is, can you still hear me, Holly? Yep, we can hear you. Yep. but. You do have a little bit of fuzziness around your voice. Okay. I've been trying to adjust it here. And if you could just try moving closer to or farther away from your microphone, that would be great. Okay. I should try and defuzz. Is this any, any better? You're a little louder, and that works. Thank you. Okay. So. We can see how this location-based data um, helps us understand and helps us see how we can actually achieve outputs on site, compare those to the other trades, and result in the plan that will actually be carried out or can actually be carried out from site. And we can see things like the critical path as well as the trades flow between the locations and the interdependencies show uh, where the, the most, the, the longest path 
falls from the start to the end of the contract. So it's all about graphic, graphically representing these tasks, uh, these trades in locations. We can see it in one view. So this flow line, uh, once we've got the power from the BIM, the information from the building information model, uh, we can visualize and we can have a better understanding of the relationships, the interrelationships between the tasks. And the planner can make uh, better decisions, more informed decisions at a glance rather than having to spend a lot of time investigating. So that brings us on to actually how we're going to use location-based methods to plan the schedule in a, in a more optimum fashion. How do we do it at the moment? Well, there are many different methods to calculate the task durations um, in a specific location, but not all of these methods are actually created equal, and the results will vary. We have a lot of experience in the industry. Um, sometimes we have to ask others in more specialized fields. Uh, maybe we have source data from industry standards or previous projects. But uh, most of these methods actually face subjectivity and, uh, and utilize many assumptions. So we've got the WAGs in there as well, the wild ass guesses. Um, I'm sure you'll agree that the best method is actually one of substance. So where we calculate the task duration based on locations, based on the equation, the balanced equation of uh, if there's more work and we use the same amount of resource, then it should really take a little bit longer to, to complete. I hope you, you would agree with that. So. I'm sure that the, you would agree that the um, best method of understanding which quantities we have, where the locations are, and how we can base the durations on this resource equation um, would actually make our schedules more accurate. And it sounds like a lot of work, but if we could automate most of this data, um, it would make our, whole, our lives a whole lot easier at the same time as making um, a more accurate schedule. So let's have a look first. Uh, because in order to investigate this resource equation, we must understand the principle of consumption first. Um, the number of man hours used to actually produce a unit of work. So we're consuming man hours, resource hours, whether they be crane hours or um, Rodman hours in this example here. And we need to understand how much they can actually um, do in that, that period of one hour. So we're looking at productivity data. How many Rodman hours does it take to install a, a ton of rebar? Well, um, maybe it's eight, maybe maybe it's ten, or even even twelve. I don't know how you guys would work, but um, many people would use different assumptions, and um, uh, some of the labour in different countries is actually more and uh, less productive. So we base these at understanding uh, principles on our own data, and sometimes on industry standard data. And if we have a look at an example, we can see how taking a floor slab of 500 square feet, we add tasks for formwork, rebar, and concrete to the schedule. Let's concentrate just on the rebar task and make the assumption that the rebar required in this slab is going to take approximately two weeks to complete. So that's an assumption. Um, it's a good start. It's showing us a start and an end date, but we've not actually based that on any resources and quantities. So how can we be sure that this is actually a correct duration? It's um, what we would term possibly an unintelligent, um, not that we haven't got experience behind it, but um, we're basing this two-week duration on up here. Maybe if we found out that there were 28 tons of rebar um, included in that floor slab, and we based it on a number of tons per day a rate of production, then that would be a little bit more um, analytical to understand where we're getting the duration from. But um, what we're suggesting that we should happen is this resource-driven um, equation where we look at the task duration is a computation of the number of resource hours required in and the number of resource hours that we have available. So we have a quantity of work multiplying by the number of hours that are consumed per unit of work and dividing that by the number of hours that we have in the day based on the number of resources that we have available. 
So we see that the two-week task can actually be a duration that's computed based on this information. In this example, we said there's 28 tons. Um, going to use a, a 12 man hours per ton as the consumption. And we can see that we've got five people working an eight hour day. Overall, the equation tells us that it's going to take 8.4 days rather than the 10 days that um, we had allocated. And this intelligent task duration actually shows most of the time between 10 and 10, 10 and 20 percent lower um, because we're removing the time risk allowance, the buffer, all of the conservative uh, assumptions, and the idea that we can start to put a real science behind the um, schedule, rather than it just being based on, on art, um, we're able to remove the float and then reallocate the float at a later date. So we can actually plan projects better by removing the waste and then reallocating that as a buffer time between other tasks. Obviously, if we did this calculation for 5,000 tasks um, and then spent time optimizing the end results, um, then it would take us a lot of time uh, using a, a, a Gantt chart and using pen and paper or an Excel spreadsheet to be able to, to do this. And then you think, well, actually, planning at this level of detail by floor is not how we would build the job. It's probably not enough detail to control the work we'd actually divide, in reality, to another level of detail. We would add a, another location hierarchy and split the slab, slabs into pores. So we'd go floor by floor and then pore by pore on each, of the, you know, on each of the floors. So now we need a new equation by pore. Oh boy, it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, but um, then the client or the project manager turns around or whoever's um, in charge of analyzing and um, sequencing the work. And they change the poor locations, and they change the sequences, and we have to recalculate all of these durations again. So what we've done is um, just change the goalposts, and it can significantly, it takes, it takes a lot of time in a Gantt chart to um, rework this information. So how can we help? Well, we're seeing that these are the most important factors to consider when we're trying to utilize BIM for a better 4D schedules. We can see that quantities, and also just there we can see that the database ties this information together, and a bit more on that later. But the quantities are important. We need to look for construction, construction caliber quantities from each of the elements that we're using. So we can see here each of the element types in the building model can provide us with some um, incredible data. Uh, and even going down to the perimeter of holes and, um, the, for example, for a slab we would only want the uh, area of the edges for the formwork. Um, if it was a slab on grade or if we were um, casting on a metal deck. So we can actually split this down and understand quantities better from the building information model. Incredibly powerful tool to be able to generate this information quickly. We can also see the second one, which was locations, and we need to be able to divide our location breakdown structure with a meaningful level of detail. So we want to be able to break down pores um, and maybe even go to uh, areas of a, so you can see in these, in 9 and 10, you can see even corridors broken out at locations uh, away from the central areas. Because uh, we would possibly uh, build out the corridor areas first but then finish them last. So it enables us to get quantity data for each of these sets of trades and work in the sequences and in the location breakdowns that are actually meaningful for the site. It's important to note as well that these are, when we create these locations in our building information model, we're able to, it produces what we say is dynamic splitting of the elements. And it enables us then to just go back into the, the 3D model and change those locations and it will then re-split and um, distribute the quantities based on our new location breakdown structure. That will obviously update the schedule and everybody will have uh, been able to uh, go home at the reasonable time rather than working through the weekend to be able to get the bid out. We also see resource productivity data. 
So we're looking for real productivity data. This is the third point. So we've got quantities, locations, and, and resources. Resources that will actually be used for carrying out the work. We can see here an example of one of our clients, how, how they've collected a significant amount of data um, for their knowledge base, and also how they've broken down the data into the operations, into the constituent parts, and even documenting it with some photos as well. So depending on the level of detail, it can be a lot of work. Um, and the important thing to consider when you're thinking about this um, significant effort to set up in the first place is that you actually only have to do it once. Um, the information is captured into a database. And also, uh, there are other ways which um, we will reveal just slightly later. So let's move on to the true workflow, the 4D workflow and see how this workflow allows us to actually um, augment many different types, many different flavors of 3D. In, in uh, maybe Revit, you've got a 3D model. Uh, the structural model in Tecla, maybe an architectural model in Archicad. We can move these 3D models and um, synchronize them in VicoOffice. So many different in environments can be brought together and activating and publishing the takeoff items to the database is done through this model management screen. We then move into, obviously, this, the second step where we looked at quantity. We need to plan quantities um, for the schedule. And we can see real data here representing each of the line items that are required to be completed. Um, and this is like a, just a spreadsheet using a very simple interface and the powerful model-driven formula so that we can compute the amount of work for each of the tasks that we're going to create. The next step is location. We're going to create the physical locations in the model so that uh, when we know how we're going to split the slab down into zones, for example, we can then maneuver these zones and split the, uh, virtually split the quantities uh, so that the quantities are divided based on the right location breakdown for our location based, based schedule. So that's the, the next step there. Once we've got the quantities by location, we can assign these quantities to tasks by dragging from the right hand side to the left hand side. So we have our list of tasks and we drag from the uh, quantity list into the scheduled task list. And this populates the information that we would then need to be able to start our location-based planning. So a small recap, we take the models. We then are automatically using a, a spreadsheet view, taking quantity data from that model, that building information model. We're then providing the location breakdown structure um, splitting the quantities, which is automated for us, and then assigning our quantities to our tasks. And once we've done this, we can produce our flow line schedule. So when we click on the button that um, opens our flow line schedule, we see that all of the hard work has been done for us. So the actual creation of the tasks, we can see that all the tasks here have already been created, all of the flow lines. They all start on day one. They all have a duration in each of the locations based on the quantity of resources that we've allocated for the work. We can then start the process of scheduling these lines. The first step is obviously to add some logic so we can go into the dependencies for these tasks. Dependencies can be added either from the flow line, the Gantt chart, or as we can see here, the network view. And because we've got locations that are integrated into our model, we can understand that complex lo logic is actually made quite easy. And this extra dimension allows uh, the power of location to be used in the linked types as well. So in addition to just a finish to finish, or a start to start, or a finish to start, start to finish, etc., links, We've got five different types of logic links that can be applied on top of that, um, that method of applying a link between two tasks. So 
just by adding one dependency can provide many location-based links. So the, the usual tedious Gantt chart linking is actually automated in, in some ways. The next step once we've joined the task together with some logic is that we're able to use an, an up, unoptimized view where we can see where tasks are poorly utilizing the yellow areas. It's poor utilization of location and um, is being highlighted in this location-based view. It's very, very powerful to be able to identify not just obviously where you're working, but probably more importantly is where you're not working. And once we have got these tasks um, and all of the dependencies have been added in the flow line, we can start by the next step, which is to balance the resources. We've got the location-based dependencies added, and now we can start adjusting the resources by, you can see here the, the green arrow. We are dragging from um, this end point. As we drag the line, we're actually saying that we are going to change something in the resource-based equation. It asks, it obviously, dragging these lines about actually is, is quite fun, but um, one of the things that we've got to uh, beware of is that there are many logical and uh, practical constraints. Um, we need some consideration to those. It's not just randomly pulling these lines about the screen. So when we drag and drop these lines, it um, pops up with the setting of the duration box, which sets us, uh, we can say, we want to change the number of crews, or we have change the production factor. Maybe we want to change the production factor in certain locations because they have been shown to be different. Maybe we got the consumption wrong in the first place. So we can we can edit this equation as we drag the resources about. Um, but usually there's a determining task that maybe cannot be altered or a selection of them. And we need to be obviously aware of this type of thing. So potentially a crane might use, uh, a task might use a crane and in order to actually increase the output, they would need another crane to be mobilized, um, whereas actually there might not be space on site. And also, we have to understand which subcontractors might just not have any more resources to be able to add to the contract. So there are some determining factors. So once we drag these lines around and um, optimize our schedule, based on some true productivity information, some true data flowing from the building information model. We can now be confident that we're providing our clients, um, our, the owners, with a, a schedule that is actually based on some substance and can be used in this hard bid environment where we are going to be tied into a contract and not actually able to um, recoup maybe some of the overhead costs. So we're trying to plan something that's more compressed so that we can actually win projects and reduce the overheads. And we're obviously trying to plan it so that um, as it's based on true information, uh, we can carry it out on site. And that will be in a, in a step as we go on. You can see here that we, we've not planned every single task to be as continuous as, as most in the schedule here. Um, this task here, we've got two where we've got broken lines. This is actually probably that they're, they're quicker tasks. I believe that we've got an inspection and then a pouring of concrete. Um, we wouldn't want to save all of these foundations to be poured at the same time, so we pour them in the locations that they're available. And we've also got, in this last task, we can see there's a planned break in the work. So rather than having a break between every location, we've said that we're going to start and finish and have continuous work through these locations We'll plan a two-week break, and then we'll come back and start again. It's also important to highlight that even though we're saying that we'll drive quantities from the building information model into the schedule, um, you don't have to. We can have tasks here that are actually non-model based, and this is the thin line representation. Um, and more about that in BIM 101, um, as you uh, would like to explore how VECO location-based scheduling can actually assist you. These, um, these lines obviously are a gut feel. They're still uh, an ex experiment. They're just uh, um, based on experience rather than uh, the actual resource equation that we've been talking about. Um, and they can be later quantified. So once we 
get some more information, once more information becomes available, then we can add that and it will refine the plan as we add as we go on. So this information is then put back into our um, BIM representation and we get a more uh, rich and robust, and if I just click, oh, okay, well, we saw some 4D playback. It's a, it's a richer and more robust presentation of um, the BIM. It's not just a marketing tool, it's actually a, a der derivation of um, using the information from the building information model and can actually be used in the trader. So we can use it to create weekly work plans or even daily work plans representing which items in the building model um, need to be installed on certain days. So it's all great to be able to provide an integrated approach where we take quantities and locations from the building model in order to provide a, a true representation of a 4D simulation, a 4D schedule. Um, what if the, there's a change? Uh, what if there's a requirement for options and what if scenarios? So in order to win some bids at the moment, um, especially when there are so many contractors uh, aiming for such a, such a small number of bids, um, Providing what if scenario analysis is usually a very good way to, to win a, an owner's uh, heart and to actually show them that you understand the project in a lot more detail than, um, than maybe most. So once we've integrated um, this data, it actually radically accelerates the process of carrying out these what if scenarios. If we have option one shown here, we can see that the schedule 28 weeks and three days, and the cost at 1.95 million. Um, that's our basis, the starting point. And we've build, built this based on quantity information, location-based scheduling, um, and the client requirements, their basic requirements. If we look at a second option, a leaner, um, a better engineered structure maybe, maybe there's less rebar to install and, and a cost saving from the reduction in, in time and the overheads that we've so talked about so far to try and reduce. And we've reduced one week from the contract, 27 weeks, and the cost has moved to 1.5 million on year. And this is, in, this is um, done by just importing the new model and basing it on all of the information you've got tied throughout the system so far. So this what-if scenario is extremely rapid to evaluate. Then the client says, Oh, I like that one. What about if I require some areas for future expansion? Um, and he almost doubles the floor area. You can see here that we just add additional locations. The quantities will change. And instead of spending all of the time crunching the data, you can actually analyze and then re-optimize the schedule. So you can see that even though we've added um, a significant amount to the building, we're actually still only at 38 weeks. So we added from the original schedule, I think it was 28 weeks, we've gone to 38 in two days. So instant feedback on understanding these um, schedule and cost changes. And we haven't really gone into cost, but there will be more on other webinars how uh, the 5D approach can actually assist you and, um, and understand that better. So just a, a general understanding of the integration that allows you to provide more options um, for the bid. It's all well and good, I hear you crying, but um, anyone can do that. Anyone can compress a schedule, um, and I, I totally agree. Uh, I've seen many instances on site that, uh, my background is actually from construction and uh, not from the, the software side, I think Holly um, said that in the introduction, but um, many times project managers have um, been discussing a schedule and saying, well, we need to reduce this, we need to cut down on the, um, the overall duration of the project. Let's have a look at the critical path. Um, and crash the critical path. And really, that's just making the project more critical. So a, a deeper understanding um, of how the actual contract con uh, program has the schedule has been created is, um, is essential. So now that we've won the hard bid based on this compressed schedule, we really need to deliver. And if we weren't, obviously, all of the hard work uh, would be wasted. So this next section just on project control is to Describe how the location-based and quantity-driven schedule can be 
completed as planned. So now we've got this. We understand the importance of loading locations and quantities, quantity base, um, driving the more optimal and compressed schedule. Um, and once we plan this perfect schedule here, um, represented by four trades working through five locations, a very simple one here. Um, let's take a look at how we can actually control that schedule. So project control, because we've got now the locations and we're able to generate this simple task matrix where we can see what's complete and what's not. The ticks in the box is representing a trade or a task being complete in a certain location. And because we've got quantities, obviously with this, sorry, this color coding, we can actually see leads to how we can see what's on time, what's completed. Probably more importantly, we should look at what's behind schedule and what's late starting. So this very visual display indicates um, a very powerful project status that's usually filtered for responsibilities, uh, printed out and, and used in weekly site meetings. And uh, many companies actually, many in the Nordic regions use it as a bonus system. So um, you can imagine um, money being removed from the bonus when they've got and, uh, the uh, yellow and the, the red squares. And uh, it very, very much helps keep that project on track and ensures that you come back in at the target that you've agreed. After ticking the boxes, these automatically populate the flow line. So once we can see this um, assimilation of project progress in a, in a matrix, we can then view it in the flow line view as we, so we can see how we are progressing against the solid lines. The solid lines here are representing our target that we've agreed in the hard bid contract. And then we can see the dotted line representing our actual progress compared. As we move the report date on, we can see that the first task started just like the early. It ran late and caused a, a knock-on effect to the start of task two. But then we mitigated these problems. Maybe we added more resource. And they were actually able to complete just before the end of the project. Overall, as we see this um, representation of the schedule, uh, usually we would analyze this on a Gantt chart and see, well, we're ahead of progress on this one. We're actually finished ahead. This one was slightly behind. Um, and this one, we're slightly ahead. So overall, it feels like we're actually doing OK. Well, it's not actually the case, not, not true to reality. Um, if, we, if we were to look at the forecast, so this is using actual productivity data, actual completions, in order to predict what might happen in the future. Um, we can understand that task two, this small delay, if we were to continue as it is, then it's likely to cause knock-on problems to tasks three and four. And in fact, not only showing a, a delay, but also here we can see a disruption. So we're having a stop and a start between the tasks. And overall, at week 15, we're showing a, a one-week overrun on the end of the contract. So this allows the decision to be made. What do we do about this? Do we bringing more resources here? Do we tell this contractor that they're going to have a break? Is that OK to do that? Can we delay the start of the task four? Are we OK with having a week today? Or um, do we just ask these guys to work the weekend so that we don't have the, the problems? That, um, so it's proactive planning rather than reactive planning. Um, you're able to make decisions and have those uh, mitigation measures actually make a difference and know where to focus that information. So. This is what it looks like. That was just to explain the basic concept of how we would control these, these um, fixed target programs. And now, what about entering the progress? This is how the matrix looks in the, in the actual application. So we can see the boxes in a bit more detail. We've got start and end dates in those boxes as well. And then we see the forecast. So past performance predicting the future. We, we always hear the caveat in the stock market speak about past performance being no indication of future returns. Um, well, that's actually true in the stock market, um, as many of us have probably been um, found out. But um, in the construction industry, it's generally a, quite a good indicator of what's likely to happen in the future, uh, when, especially when tasks are loaded with quantities and these calculations are done for us. So therefore, 
um, we're able to analyze it quite quickly based on the performance. Um, and then we can spend more time fixing the problems. So trying to adhere to this fixed schedule, we can then implement control actions by right-clicking on each of the tasks that are having problems. You can see here this task, the second task there of ordering the piles is running late. So we can right-click to say edit the plan. And as we edit the plan, we can then start to make informed decisions about what we're going to do to mitigate that and to bring the project back on track. So in this example here, we're adding another crew to a few of the locations. In this next example, I must highlight as well, when you are actually editing this ordering of the piles task, what happens is the view filters so that you can see the predecessor and the successor and you're able to isolate and be able to really interrogate what's going on with just these tasks in the view. For the first one, we added more resources. We added another crew in some locations. The second one here, we're going to add actually more time. So we're making them, instead of using the project calendar, we're going to make them work a seven-day week. So we're going to be mean. But the overall result is that we mitigate the risk of a project delay. So by utilizing the through 4D BIM, we're able to show the real um, state of affairs. And in this example, we can see that we've brought it in um, before the end date. So the previous ones were running over. In this example, by maybe two or three weeks. And now that we've added more resources to this trade here, we can see that even though we're likely to have a knock-on effect, we're, we're actually absorbing that and minimizing the effect on the rest of the trades. Can't always be a perfect world, but we can try and get there. So overall, 4D BIM um, provides us many benefits. And I'm not going to run through the list. I'm not going to read them all out. Um, they're there for, for you to, to have a look at. But um, in general, this true 4D BIM can really help us to improve our scheduling improve the accuracy, the granularity, so that we can, as we showed in the example, get to a location by location on each floor, so a zone by zone rather than just floor by floor schedule. The granularity that we're actually going to need to um, put the, put the uh, correct schedule together to be able to optimize the schedule using the location-based quantities and resources. Um, overall, because we've got more information behind it, it's more predictable. Um, and Overall, we're, we're trying to use the location-based concepts to uh, reduce the conflicts, make sure that trades don't interfere with each other and aren't idle um, or looking for work to do and not, or trying to do something that's not actually going to add value. So we can focus the efforts a lot more clearly. So they're the business benefits um, of employing all of this. And it's a lot to ask. It's a big ask. And you might have been sitting there listening to this and feeling that uh, it was a lot of data to gather, uh, all of the means and methods data that we've been discussing. However, pleased as I intimated earlier that there is actually a cheat. Um, we can get you started straight away uh, by importing a standard database, a standard package from, from Vico. Um, this standardized set of data it can be built yourselves or as um, we've done with many clients, um, we can actually provide it. It's years of experience in the construction industry, um, and really it's the experience from working on hundreds of projects in, in the virtual construction arena um, at this level of detail that we've been discussing. So uh, we do actually have another webinar that Holly will talk about that's devoted just to the standard database. I think it's on December the 11th, so, so watch out for that. And we will advert within. So in summary, um, as we are slowly approaching the hour, contracts are moving into a more hard bid environment. Um, it's actually nice to use BIM on negotiated bids to ensure better collaboration. But um, as we've seen, as we move into this climate of um, pressured bidding and not many projects being available, we're actually looking at BIM being used on all projects and ensuring that complete and realistic schedules can be tracked on, on site and controlled and meet the agreed targets. So 
the difference between employing little BIM and big, big BIM, this uh, discussion is getting the mo most from the BIM, getting most from the information in the BIM. So we understood that we can optimize, and we also showed the controlling side of things. So once we've created this perfect plan, um, implementing it is sure to be difficult, but using the tools that we showed you, um, complying with that target, a fixed contract duration, we're able to um, actually comply and deliver as planned. There's support behind. Um, one of our services teams can jumpstart any project you're working on, uh, get to grips with things, and uh, actually quickly support your demanding hard bid environment, your requirements. Um, we've got a special hard bid offering that's designed specifically at these crunch times, so um, ask about that if that actually is a requirement for you. We develop them. Um, and create many what if scenarios to create uh, the pictures to owners so that you can convey exactly uh, your true understanding of the project and its options. And by tying the quantities from the model, the resources, the materials, the durations, uh, we can produce an overall better schedule, the, uh, the better estimate, and, and a better bid. So that's the, the, the services side of things that we can offer. But Vico offers the software to support this also. So with being the only integrated BIM solution that allows you to actually synthesize your BIMs from your favorite authoring tools and leverage that geometry so you can optimize the, the 4D, you can actually derive a 4D rather than um, have a contrived 4D schedule. So as there's a lot of growing interest in elements from the building information models being collected in databases, uh, we actually understand that the best practices are to illustrate that this could be collected for the cost and time elements as well and contained within a database. So that's Vico's answer to um, a database, an all-encompassing 5D database. So Abraham Lincoln reminded us that, um, and this is Vico coming in again, um, to say that 4D can just be linking a 3D model to a, a scheduled uh, set of time but um, if you want to really leverage BIM and use it to its maximum capability to create more optimum, more granular, uh, better schedules, then um, we suggest you get in touch. And um, the difference between them um, will sure be um, a difference that you can take forward on, on contract. So with that, I thank you for your time. And um, I know that I rushed through with uh, a number of points there that there will be, I'm sure, questions on. So I'll hand back to Holly, and we can take all of your questions and discuss any of the points that we've brought up. Clive, are you handing back control to me? Uh, I am trying. You okay. can do it if you... <laughs> you bet. I'll go ahead and take it. There we go. Just one moment and I'll go ahead and show my screen. So as everyone goes ahead and types in their questions to Clive, we'd just like to do a quick 30 second uh, Vico commercial as you type. Some might be playing Jeopardy music in the background, but here goes. Let me try and wrap this up in 30 seconds. We're heading out on the road uh, this uh, next week. We're heading over to the BIM for Business conference uh, sponsored by McGraw-Hill out in San Francisco. Concurrently, we'll also be at the CMIC user group. I don't know how many of you use CMIC as your ERP for construction platform, but we do have a unique integration with them uh, with our DocSet manager application so that, in essence, uh, we can use their platform as a change management uh, ERP system so that those changes that you find in 2D drawings can be uh, not only controlled and contained, but also documented for legal purposes as well as accounting purposes. Don't forget, if you haven't seen our BIM 101 series, as Clive was alluding to, not only the BIM 101, but the BIM 401 offer a demonstration of VECO control. 
And then, of course, if you're interested in seeing our customer examples, uh, customer case studies, I would point you specifically to correspond with this webinar to the Denver Justice Center case study uh, offered by Hensel Phelps. In that particular webinar, uh, they offer a great side-by-side -side comparison of their web camera on site along with the 4D schedule that they prepared in Vico Control. You can see the building go up just as they had planned it in Vico Control. It's an amazing uh, end of that webinar. If you are looking for the Bible on 4D BIM scheduling, we recommend uh, sincerely that you check out uh, our colleague Ollie's book. Ollie just published this book as part of his PhD process. Uh, with one of our um, with one of our colleagues, Russell Kenley in Australia, location-based management systems are the key, and we believe it's a key differentiator for Vico, as you saw in this webinar. Being able to use location uh, quantities by location makes all the difference in shaving off that 10 to 20 percent for your schedules. Um, Ali has blogged about this book and there's certainly more information about it on our website. We ask you to take a look. It's a hefty tome with a hefty price tag, but darn worth it. Now, as, as Clive was saying, this is part one of our four-part series on winning hard bids. Um, coming up next, we do have uh, cost planning or, or, or creating your cost plans, different versions of the estimate in order to help you win a hard bid. Then we have constructability and coordination strategies. And then we wrap it up with uh, an interesting discussion of whether or not to build or buy a knowledge base for these cost and time elements. If you like us on Fridays with Vico, we dare you, we double dog dare you to follow us on Twitter. Today on Twitter, you would have seen a, an interesting string of tweets about GM Batista Vico, our namesake. Um, not only our puppy, but also the namesake of our company. We also have uh, comics, blogs, and our uh, user group on LinkedIn. And we certainly hope you'll join us there. Now let's go ahead and open this up to questions and answers. And we've got questions uh, that, that span a complete uh, range of different topics. So if everyone doesn't mind, uh, we'll go ahead and answer every question, um, whether or not it was, uh, it was covered in today's webinar. And we'll certainly point you to resources that can help you um, on different parts of our website, uh, different archived versions of Fridays with FICO, our blogs, et cetera. So let's start this out with a question from our audience. And oh, excuse me. Uh, also on our um, expert panel today is David Wilkinson, another of our 5D BIM specialists. Uh, he's a pre-construction specialist, and he's located in Hingham, Massachusetts, just down the coast, about 30 miles away from me. Hopefully freezing too, because it is it turned fall <laughs> here in the Northeast. Let's go ahead and open this up, Clive or David if either of you would like to take this. Um, this is in regards to the, um, the production control checklist and look-ahead schedules that we saw in Clive's presentation. Is, this, is the product accurate enough to be used to confirm percent complete on subcontractors' monthly payment requisitions? Clive, I know we didn't go into using this as part of uh, an accounting checks and balances system, but mm -hmm. have you have you run into this in the field? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, because of the data being tied right the way through from quantities, um, we can add costs, and the percent complete on each of those tasks will uh, provide a payment schedule um, and evaluation for the project. It's um, we have some. Uh, I mean. What I've, what we showed you here today is uh, just a workflow. So later on, um, we'll have many other demonstrations and obviously get in touch. But um, it's, it's not an inconse inconsequential tool, and the level of detail that can be added and used in that um, context is um, incredible. So yes, is the answer. If uh, so if I just add to that, Holly, uh, uh, actually, 
Uh, a few of our clients have, well, I, one of our clients that I know specifically has um, used the, um, uh, the, the simulation, uh, it takes a JPEG of the simulation with the date uh, showing uh, up in the corner uh, and compares it to the percent complete information in the payment requisition. Uh, also uh, with a digital photo uh, of the project site. So in this case it was steel and according to the simulation which is tied directly to the schedule if you were looking at the project you should be seeing this much steel in place um, and uh, you could see from the digital photograph that they took of the uh, same section of the job that that was not the case. So uh, a couple of different ways for it to be used um, th that I thought was pretty interesting. Thanks, David. And here's another thing, you know, we didn't get into. This question is from Ralph. He was asking, would you be showing how to model risks to the schedule with PERT techniques or Monte Carlo simulations to account for external factors such as weather? We, we can certainly do that. Um, we've got a Monte Carlo risk simulation within the scheduling software that um, we just add certain risks, whether you use the standard risks and just say whether it's high, medium, or low, um, and they can be related to the start of the task, um, the duration of the task, etc. And they run the Monte Carlo simulation as many iterations as you desire, and it actually results in showing, indicating uh, all of those um, end results, so you can scroll through all of those end outcomes and see what the overall probability is of achieving, for example, your watertight deadline, um, if it's got to be before a certain period, um, and indeed the overall schedule end date. So absolutely. Sorry that we haven't got time to, to show that, but um, if that's a, a requirement, then uh, please get in touch, and we can certainly show you, that, show you more about that. Thanks. Now, here's one of those questions that goes completely off topic. Uh, for just a second, but it, it, it recalls the, the current controversy in the market of what do we want in a model? And I think, Clive, you, you, you described this in your construction calibers quantity slide of what information do we want from the designer's BIM and what information do we not want from the designer's BIM and then how in Vico Office do we go ahead and combine multiple models, so the MEP model, the structural model, the architectural model, and derive those construction caliber quantities. So Clive or David, do you want to take a crack at this? Or we can address this certainly in the follow-up to the webinar. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what you said was really a um, part of the answer to say that we can uh, take any model elements from the authoring tools that uh, we can integrate with. And we can cut and slice that data quite um, in a very um, flexible way within the environment. And by changing uh, what type of tool, for example, somebody's modeled a, a beam with a slab, and we can actually change that within to get the correct properties from uh, Vico Office. So it's very flexible. Um, the spreadsheet-like interface allows you to do the computation. Um, and yes, there are some requirements that are um, that can be mandated to your designer so that uh, it's a lot easier for you to integrate with. Um, and that's probably better a conversation offline to go into the detail. All right. Now let's move to a series of questions from Rahendra. And he asks, can we use this software to know the strength of the location when we plan to establish our project? As I'm reading that, is Rahendra, Rahendra asking the question, can we use this software to determine site stability? The strength of a location. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question fully. I don't know whether, I David, do you understand? David, did you want to chime in, or do you want to hear my interpretation of the question? <laughs> I'd like to try and get a little bit better interpretation. I'm sorry. I'm 
My, my interpretation of the question is, does the software do any sort of um, stability readings, any sort of seismic data, any sort of uh, grading of foundation tensile strengths, et cetera? And right. I don't, you know, so, I so, uh, could be on uh, the end. Mm -hmm. About the engineering calculation side of things, yes. No, that, that's um, that's not something that we uh, have covered here, but uh, obviously can be part uh, of the. Sorry, David. Yeah, no, there is one. I mean, one of the things that that you can do, and and, I, and I, I'm not sure if this is going to actually answer the question specifically, but um, the the way the database is set up, uh, you know, our prior releases, uh, we were limited to three tiers of data that you could link to each one of the. Um, of the elements in the model. Um, Vico Office has no limitation and uh, you are able to add sets of data to individual elements. So while the calculation, the, those engineering calculations would not be uh, generated by the Vico Office itself, attaching that data to the element is very possible utilizing um, uh, the multi-tiered uh, database setup that we have. Uh, we set this up in, with you know, things like lead certification in mind so that you can keep track of your elements and their lead, um, uh, their, their lead uh, evaluation and analysis. Um, uh, things like COBE data so that you can attach um, lots of equipment uh, and maintenance information to elements. So being able to, as we call it, say tag it with um, uh, with engineering data is very feasible, but that data would not be generated by Vico Office. A, a follow-up question asks, can we use this software for altitude and longitude simulation based on sun location for green building concepts? And I, I, I think that question begs uh, a little editorial note from me, and that is, uh, one of the difficulties in the BIM marketplace is the inaccurate use of vocabulary. And I'll go ahead and take a stand and, and take responsibility for that myself as a marketing professional. But I think there is a, um, a use of the word simulation uh, that is very inaccurate. And Clive alluded to that in his slides when he, when he said, what we're doing here is 4D BIM. Not, not simulations. A simulation is a movie. And then in the engineering side of things, a simulation is a completely different animal. A simulation would be how will wind shearing affect this building? Uh, and uh, as Rahendra says in his question, you know, uh, how, how will sun location and, uh, and different weather patterns affect, seasonal weather patterns affect this building? That's a simulation on the engineering front. So let's let's move to. If I ahead. just want just one thing that I, I want to, on that particular question because I'm I'm actually working with a client on that now. That really that question is really more specific to the modeling platform that they choose. Um, that kind of information uh, I do know that the uh, that the the more popular platforms that are out there uh, certainly Revit, ArchiCAD, Constructor, are all capable of doing a. Um, uh, a, a sun location shading simulation, uh, but it, it, and the reason I make the point is because that you know Vico is is uh, uh, a platform that utilizes many different uh, uh, modeling engines, but in and of itself is not a modeling engine. That that kind of analysis is really going to more likely be done inside of the uh, uh, the, the modeling engine itself. Now, they do have the capability, all of those platforms that I mentioned, to do what's called a GBXML export. And that is, contains uh, the information for some of the analysis that you are talking about, uh, which if you wanted to tag that to the uh, building information model inside of Vico Office, you could do that. But that's really going to be something that you're going to do in your modeling platform. Perfect. And now we go back to a, um, a particular example Clive had offered during the webinar. The question is, in the rebar task duration that you showed, how efficient, accurate, and reliable is that rebar task duration? 
And if I recall, Clive, I believe we were comparing a gut assumption with um, what our actuals were based on crew size. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the essence of that question is really what the, the webinar is all about. Um, we're trying to provide better data. So it's not that we're making so many assumptions and so many wags. Um, we're actually creating the schedule based on something really very tangible and very scientific. So it is more accurate um, and more reliable because we are generating the, the real quantity of work and we're basing the actual outcome of the duration on how much resource and how productive that resource is. And then one thing to add to that is that because this knowledge is, um, again, an assumption, uh, but we are going to the more granular level, so it's more accurate rather than just an assumption that is at a high level of detail. Um, that data actually can be refined as you go up and go through and on and on through your projects, so that instead of using uh, an estimate of a productivity, you're actually using the true productivities that come from your previous projects of a similar nature. So that's a real um, a benefit from it. And then you can also get industry standard data um, that is uh, not far off as well. So hopefully it should be actually more accurate and more reliable. And recall too that your subcontractors um, will make more informed bids if they better understand that you are not going to be stopping and starting them. Mm -hmm. so you're yeah, no, absolutely. And from the other side of that is um, the tool allows you to work with your subcontractors um, Maybe not in the hard bid environment where you get a short period of time to, to bid for the job, but um, it's more beneficial to get your subcontractors involved, and obviously this can be uh, an ongoing thing with your regular, the, the uh, contractors that you use quite often, is that their data is the data that you should be using. So you can gather their, how many resources they will use and how, how they believe they will be productive on that task. And then with some very small alterations to contracts, they can be tied into that on a bonus system that um, is obviously uh, applicable to everyone, um, a win-win basis. So very, very important to get them involved. Good point. This next question wins as my favorite question of the webinar. It comes from Don, and he asks, how do you manage off-site activities, for example, prefabricated components and precast slabs, et cetera? You know, again, I apologize. We can't even go into some of the, the functionality of VECO control, but Clive, if you could talk a little bit about procurement lead times and, and off-site manufacturing, that would be great. Sure, sure. I mean, there are two components to this. One is that uh, those activities can actually, when, when we're thinking about actually prefabricating rebar, um, maybe you're fabricating some cages on site. I did this for a, a client recently where they included a task that showed actually how quickly they could provide these um, based on the area that they had available on a very cramped site, um, how quickly they could actually out and send out these cages. So that was the determining rate of productivity, the rate of production for the follow-on trades. So that actually was displayed in the schedule as a flow line. Um, and based on the amount of time that it took to, uh, to fix each of the cages. But um, as Holly said there, because we've got the quantities loaded into each of these tasks, uh, managing off-site activities, so uh, the procurement uh, workflow of actually going for bids and bringing back people, uh, people's bids and comparing them and then placing an order, all of these stages, all of these milestones in um, the prerequisites that need to be completed before a task can start can also be included and um, are actually linked to and utilize the quantities uh, to show you, for example, when you're going to require um, some of the, let's say in the example that um, in the question is precast slabs. So when will we require um, these slabs and how many or whatever components you are actually uh, managing as off-site activities, so it's very comprehensive in that in that way, and the integration means that um, everything is tied together. And I believe too, in our um, BIM 201 webinar on um, coordination of time and space, um, 
sounds like a heady topic, and it is, uh, but we also use an example there of not only procurement lead times, um, but also those manufacturing lead times, uh, so that you're not, you're not just looking for clashes of uh, components or materials, you're looking for clashes of lead times as well. Here's a question from David. He asks, can we feed RS means or other database information into VICO to fill in the gaps in our own data? Or does VICO provide an automated import method for these processes? Do you want me to take that? That'd be great. Thank you. So yes, we can bring in um, other data. Um, there are different methods to that. Uh, with Office, uh, there will be a an Excel dumping interface where we can um, use the, the process of just copy and paste. Um, and also, this is what our services team has, has done for many years, is actually providing um, the databases based on both RS means data um, if the client hasn't got their own data for some certain aspects. Maybe they self-perform concrete and uh, have a lot of data on that, but from um, MEP side of things, they, they might not have any data. Um, and yes, we can fill the gaps with um, with those, um, whether it be industry standard or whether it be um, based on um, we have we employ in our um, professional services team uh, guys from the construction industry. So we have professional estimators and the like that uh, can assist you in that uh, creation of the data that's uh, all encompassing for your for your business. So. If I could just add to that. Um, Clive, we have used the productivity information out of RS means and, and find it quite good. I, I know that some people have questions about the pricing and the regionality of the pricing, but we've had good results from the productivity data and the crew sizes that you can pull out of RS means. Thanks, David. Here's, here's a great question by Daniel, and I just wish we had more time. Uh, but his question is, could you please walk us through some details of how the software works? What happens after you import a BIM model from Revit or Tefla or ARCHICAD? And Clive, I know we were just working on that yesterday as a team. Would you mind just highlighting the different uh, steps that you can accomplish with Vico Office? Sure, uh, absolutely. So. From uh, the workflow that we were talking about today for the 4D side of things, um, we will also have be, be having webinars and we can do uh, sort of private show and tell demo, demos if there's a requirement for it. But um, we take the models, um, they are published from the uh, respective environment. So within Revit there is a publisher, click on the publish button, um, that information is pushed into the database so that Vico Office can read the element geometry um, within Office. There is a recalculation, so it means that everything is uh, generated with, as we say, this construction caliber quantity um, data that is then uh, used in a spreadsheet environment so you can add non-model based items as well as utilizing this uh, very powerful formula editor to generate a, a breakdown. Um, this can also obviously be populated by the standard database that we talk about, so just by bringing in the model, um, we can drag the required components from a standard database to be able to create this information. We showed you just briefly the, the steps which were to create locations, um, and the locations would virtually split the elements to be able to provide the quantities by location, and then we would go through into the scheduling side of things to assign those quantities to tasks, and then go off and schedule. So, um, that procedure of bringing in a, a model, using the spreadsheet to generate, um, or the database to generate the quantities, breaking the locations as you would use for pause, um, and your general, um, the way that you would break the work down, so the location breakdown structure to manage the work, um, pushing it into the control environment, which is for the scheduling, and really then using location-based scheduling to the, uh, the maximum um, extent by having better data. And um, the, the idea behind that um, is to optimize the schedule um, and then provide that data um, back to the, uh, the 3D model. So that as you change tasks in the 3D model, that will update the, the timing for each of the components and 
uh, to change the timing and the schedule. So um, that will update the timing for the components and um, your for do and if you complete the cost, you will have five being there as well. So um, that's a really a, a chat around the general workflow um, and how the how the software works. But um, let's uh, let's take that on either the future webinars where we show actually some live demos, um, or so that we can uh, discuss things uh, and later that just please get in contact. Thanks, Clive. Here's a question from Dwayne. Can leveraging true 40 BIM help me plan my MEP sequencing, or is it just for planning structure and architect architecture activities? Yeah, I could probably. Jacob, yeah, for I could, Well, I was going to answer that one because uh, we probably just did one of the more detailed MEP sequencing projects that we've ever done. Um, uh, that and it, it proved out that not only can you uh, get down to a, a high level of detail with uh, MEP systems, but you can vet out very well whether or not the logistics that are being recommended will work. Um, and in fact, in, in uh, this instance, we determined that the, the original plan as submitted by the subcontractors, um, once they saw the uh, sequence, uh, they they reversed it uh, almost a uh, uh, 180 in how they were going to uh, put the uh, um, the MEP in place. So yes, it's it's very effective uh, for that. I would just um, uh, the give you the caveat emptor is that you know you can only really sequence what you model. So you have to model to the level of detail that you want to demonstrate in your sequence, uh, particularly if there are going to be some um, uh, some dicey uh, uh, parts of the sequence and, and, and uh, uh, construction or uh, installation of the uh, units. Well, here is a great question. I'm going to read it word for word. Not a question, but an endorsement for Ollie's book. I highly recommend it. Thank you, Jay. You could say great content about CPM as well as line of balance. We couldn't agree more thoroughly. I think we all have it on our bedside table. <laughs> we just got our copies here in the office last week. Here's a question from Ram. He asks, how are interior rough-in and finish activities modeled and represented? Have any of your clients used 4D to represent these activities? Yeah, so I take that one? Sure, you hopped okay. on first. <laughs> um, so we can go through the level of detail that the model is representing. Um, so, so for example, uh, we have actually got models that have got um, for interior walls all of the stud work and, and the sheeting going on the outside and we can take quantities from these elements and represent them. Or um, we can actually take the information for the interior up in from um, just a, a single element that's created as a wall. So it does depend on the level of detail that the model is represented at. Um, but it doesn't actually alter the way that you are able to display this information. So in our, um, I can call it playback, um, you can actually represent certain sides of uh, a wall as being finished on their own, or we can actually get quantities for finishes from zones that are presented in the model. So uh, for each of the rooms, we can have different room zones and take the quantities for the external faces. Um, so there are many ways of doing that, um, and they can actually be seen in the 4D representation. Yeah. It just just to kind of follow on with that, because um, there's been several questions around that, and, and uh, you know uh, we always have this, the expression to model or not to model. That is the question, and and. Uh, all of those questions beg the uh, the model progression specification to be used uh, ahead of time, so that uh, that everybody understands what's going to be modeled, when it's going to be modeled. So you sort of back into the model progression spec, saying, "Well, we want to be able to show studs in the sequence." Well, then that means that there's a level of detail that has to go into the model progression spec. So whoever is responsible for that modeling understands that, oh, this is what I have to do when I model this element. 
So uh, there is a, a significant amount of planning that goes on that we've certainly learned. We've done about 350 of these for our clients, and, and, and that's why we designed the model for Crescent Spec and, and gave it up to the public domain, because that, that is the kind of thing that you want to plan out ahead of time and not find out after the fact that you can't do it. Thanks, David. And this next question, I'm going to label it the $64 million question. It comes from Mike, and he asks, generally in a hard bid scenario, the general contractor has two or three weeks for the bid. Architects will not give out their models uh, to everyone before the bid. So how do you complete a model in two weeks that is accurate enough for the estimate? David, right. I know you've been working with um, Ali and, um, and, our, and our team in Budapest. Could you explain a little bit about our hard bid offerings as well as maybe touch on some of the Six Sigma modeling techniques that we employ to, to meet those deadlines? Yeah, and, and, and great insight by the questioner, by the way. Uh, it, it, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that I don't, it is very difficult to model uh, and generate 3D, 4D, 5D information uh, at that rate of speed. Uh, we started several months ago to develop a process that will allow us to do that and in fact have, uh, have demonstrated the process and are now capable of doing in more than uh, half the time uh, we are able to generate 3D, 4D, 5D information. So let's give an example, say on a $100 million project size. Uh, we can generate 3D, 4D, and 5D output inside of four weeks and we stream that information over the period of time. So in two weeks, you're getting your architectural and structural data. Um, in three weeks, you're getting your MEP data. So um, it is possible. Um, of course, uh, that doesn't mean that you're not going to use some of your standard processes. Uh, you know that as a, as a general contractor or construction manager, uh, you don't take off every detail even when you do a hard bid. You, you, you rely upon experience, you rely upon taking off those things that you want to make sure you have good information on, and you rely upon your subcontractors to give you some insights and some help on the, uh, on the bid itself. Our system, Vico Office, is designed to combine all of those. It's designed to be able to input traditional information, things that you know right off the top of your head that are going to be uh, pretty, uh, pretty doggone close in that type of building or that type of construction. And then as you decide what exactly do we need to model in order to get this bid to where we want it, that we're comfortable. Um, and our system is designed to say, yeah, let's do a combination of, of uh, our experiential uh, knowledge base as well as our model-driven knowledge base. That combination and our process that we've done, and, and by the way, it, it is, uh, Six Sigma is, is a, uh, I will say, painful process of documentation and continuous improvement, but it's absolutely necessary because when you model as fast, that fast, you have to have processes in place that make sure you don't make any mistakes or errors in the uh, so the Six Sigma process governs all of our processes as we develop them and as we continuously improve them. But we do now know that it is possible to do this on hard bid, um, and it, but it, it will be uh, ultimately a combination of uh, existing uh, knowledge base that you have and um, models, modeling information that we will combine into the overall hard bid. Thanks, David. You know, that is the last question in the queue. I know as soon as I say that, though, it, a last question comes in. So please feel free to go ahead and type your one last question uh, for us. But with that, I'll go ahead and start wrapping up. And I just wanted to remind everyone, uh, coming up in two weeks, uh, not part of our hard bid series, but part of our um, product launch series, we have the new uh, Constructability Manager uh, that we're going to be demonstrating and debuting. Uh, Constructability Manager not only handles clash detection, RFIs, and change order management, but it's integrated into the VECO office environment. 
So as Clive was describing the process, you're publishing uh, your models from Revit, from ARCHICAD, from Tecla. You are combining them into one model. You are going ahead and doing your clash detection. You are resolving those clashes. You're doing your quantity takeoffs. You're doing your schedules and your estimates based on those quantities. And uh, then you're, you're using production control uh, from control to be able to go out to the job site and make sure that you hit your schedule and your budget. So join us on September 25th for the debut of Constructability Manager. Then, of course, as we had said earlier, we're, we're completing our um, hard bid information, hard bid series with estimating or, or 5D cost planning coming up on the 16th of October. November 13th, constructability and coordination as part of your hard bid. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to do a hard bid and then make up for it and change orders. It's another thing to understand which change orders you can anticipate and include them in your bid beforehand. And then on December 11th, we'll be having that discussion about, should I buy or build my database? As you're exiting today's webinar, you will receive a survey. It'll pop up in an ex external uh, browser. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, we would love to hear from you what the hard bid situation is in your geography. You know, we have, we have webinar participants from all over the world, so we'd like to hear not only how this is impacting you throughout the United States, but throughout the rest of the world. So with that, I'm going just to double check to see if no more questions came in. That's great. And we will see you all back here on the 25th of September for the debut of Constructability Manager. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.